John Lilly was the best-selling writer of the Elizabethan period, the period we now think of as Shakespeare's time. Um, so he's the best-selling writer of the, of the period and um, starts his career by writing two prose fictions, uh, which is uh, a term we use often to avoid saying the word novel. These are curious stories about a young, um, relatively pretentious Greek man trying to make his way around the world, um, particularly in relationship with women, and then later in his job as an academic. Uh, Lily's two prose fictions become, as I say, the best-selling works of the period, and he seems to have then been headhunted by the Earl of Oxford to front a group of boy actors who perform plays in London in the Blackfriars Theatre and later at St Paul's. And these plays also went on to Elizabeth I's court. And so you could go to these theatres in London um, in the knowledge that you were communing with the stories that Elizabeth would be about to see. Then, most excitingly, Lily went on to publish these works, at which point you could purchase these texts and commune, commune with them once again. These are like the DVDs of the rock concert that you missed. The Earl of Oxford is, a, at this stage in his uh, career, a relatively young uh, aristocrat with... Um, it's, it's hard to know how polite to be about the Earl of Oxford. The Earl of Oxford, of course, is the person that people believe wrote Shakespeare's plays, and he's a very unlikely candidate for this role. Most of what we know about him was his mistreatment of his wife, his ability to pick up rent boys in Italy, and his interest in necromancy. Uh, so he's a very curious figure, but he had a clear courtly ambition, despite what seems to have been a lack of interest in politics. So his way into the court seems to have been this attempt to develop a, a literary role. He becomes a literary patron for people writing prose stories um, and also um, funds, uh, founds this theatre company, which Lily then fronts. Lily first uh, comes into contact with Oxford following the publication of Lily's first work, the first of these prose fictions. And after that, he seems to have been approached by Oxford to become what is called a secretary, which is a very difficult term in this period, somebody who keeps your secrets. So it's quite hard to know quite what Lily's doing. But Oxford is then the patron for the sequel, the second prose fiction Lily writes, and thereafter Oxford is the patron for Lily's plays. The hardest thing for a modern audience to get their head around in relation to the boy companies is that the boy companies were the most elite form of performers. We think now of children's performance as the thing you see at school, and with apologies to any mums and dads who are offending here, uh, we don't often tend to treat that as the, as the elite form of performance. Whereas for the Tudors, it's the boys who go to the court to sing and then to perform for the monarch. So these are the highest status form of performers. And there's a tradition of this going right back to at least Henry VIII and possibly some people trace it back as far as Richard II's court. Uh, and it picks up in Elizabeth's period as we suddenly get these new uh, purpose-built theatrical spaces opening up in London. So a stage and an auditorium built, in this case, um, indoors in the Blackfriars space and in St Paul's um, for performance. And it's boys who are housed in these particular uh, spaces because, of course, you have the choir boys singing uh, at Blackfriars and at St Paul's. Well, the first Blackfriars Theatre is built uh, within, obviously, the Blackfriars complex. So the Blackfriars was a monastery until the 1530s, when Henry VIII um, has the, uh, the monasteries um, disrupted and taken apart. So the Blackfriars uh, become a residential space thereafter. Um, and it's not possible to found theatre buildings in the City of London. The City of London authorities are not keen on these public spaces, and they are the only public spaces in early modern England, apart from churches and execution grounds, where you can gather with people you don't know. Um, and where you do get theatres built up is outside the city walls, and then within the walls in what are called the Liberties, and the Blackfriars is an example of the Liberties. So as t in terms of its, of its space, its associations are heavily religious and indeed Catholic, and the, the theatres that, that are built in, in the Blackfriars, there are two theatres built, built there over, over time, um, come, come with all those associations. So uh, famously, Shakespeare and Fletcher's Henry VIII includes a scene in which um, the Queen is put on trial, Catherine of Aragon is put on trial, in the very room in which she was originally put on trial. Ben Jonson's The Alchemist is a play about three people in a room in the Blackfriars. And you slowly begin to realise, as you watch the play, that it's actually set in the room that the audience are sitting in. Uh, and so Lily's plays, like uh, Jonson's and Shakespeare's plays for that space, come with all of those associations. 
St Paul's Playhouse is similar to the Blackfriars in the sense that they are the only two uh, permanent indoor performing spaces at this time. So this is the period in which the outdoor theatres are beginning to open. We think somewhere between two to 3,000 people could be accommodated within an outdoor playing space. Whereas for the first Blackfriars Theatre and for St Paul's, we're looking more at around 60 people. So much more intimate space. Um, prices are therefore much higher. There's also the um, cost factor of lighting, which is provided by candles. Um, and that also requires that acts are written, uh, plays are written in five acts so that the, um, the performance can be paused in order to trim the candles. This is, this is early modern health and safety here. So that's, that's the kind of things that set this apart from the outdoor theatres. Our greatest sense of the audience for these indoor spaces are that they were a more elite audience. Um, that's in relation to this higher ticketing prices um, that you would have been required to pay. There is, however, quite a lot of evidence that people like Shakespeare and people working for the outdoor theatres were also seeing these plays. So there may well also have been a mix of what you might call theatre professionals coming to the shows as well. So a strange combination then of um, the rich and well-to-do and also people interested in the theatre more generally coming to see these plays. Lily's writing at a time in which these early theatres are just beginning and people are still trying to discover the kinds of stories that will fascinate audiences. And what sets Lily apart from what's happening around him is his turning to Greek stories in particular. And that's something which feels unusual even later on in the period. So if you think about Shakespeare writing his Roman plays, we don't really get um, Greek plays from Shakespeare, Timon of Athens being the exception. Um, Lily's plays are, are therefore different in their, their recourse to Greek myth and Greek legend. So he begins by writing about Alexander the Great, um, about Galatea, um, about Sappho, who in Greek myth or Greek legend is a poet. Lily makes her more of a, a virginal queen. But that's, that's something that sets his work apart. The biggest thing that sets his work apart, and it's unique in early modern theatre, is his use of prose in every play. There's one exception to that, which is The Woman in the Moon. Lily, by this point, is already the most fam uh, famous prose writer using his prose fiction, Euphues, The Anatomy of Wit, Euphues and His England, the sequel. And the prose translates onto the stage. And so it came with this, this authorial badge, if you like. People would have heard the language and associated it with Lily himself, even if they didn't know who'd written the plays. So the language and the story set the plays apart as well. Sappho and Phaeo is Lily's second play, and Lily is adapting a story from Ovid in which uh, Sappho writes a love letter complaining about her love affair for, for uh, Phaeo. And um, Sappho in this, in this poem is suicidal, miserable, and has obviously had a very exciting sex life in the past. Lily does some very odd things to that, turning Sappho into a virginal queen. There's no sense of her being a queen in, in the Ovidian source and turning Phaeo into a fairy boy who gets picked up by Sappho, quite literally in this case, and turned into a courtier. The modern equivalent would be Queen Elizabeth II um, having an exciting time with a local cabbie. Uh, so it's a story about courtly ambition, but a courtly ambition on the part of someone who doesn't really want to be a courtier. Phaeo is kind of caught up in this world almost against his will. At the start of the play, Venus enters and explains to her son Cupid how irritating it is that Sappho won't fall in love. And she decides that she's going to make her fall in love. And she, she defines that, that decision in specifically phallic terms. She says, she is amiable and therefore must be pierced. And the play is about Sappho sidestepping that compulsory heterosexual turn that, Ver uh, that Venus wishes to impose on her. If you imagine yourself sitting watching Sappho and Phaeo at the Elizabethan court, your seat, your placement within the audience is determined entirely by your rank and your relationship with the Queen, who will be sat just a few chairs away from you. And you're watching a play about someone who is being forced into the court and forced out from the court against his own will. And so you're watching a play which plots out the very things that have brought you to see the, to the court in the first place. So this play would have been electrifyingly scary and exciting for an Elizabethan courtier as they think about their ambitions, a male or a female courtier, and they watch this boy being forced into the court and Sappho being forced to reject him by her role as queen. 
So Sappho and Phaeus performed at court in a season of plays, which includes Lily's Campaspe, which is about Alexander the Great and his love for a slave girl, a prisoner, uh, a war prisoner at that. And so Lily's already started to ask the court about the relationship between powerful figures and very powerless figures and what that tells you about sexuality. And the very next day, the audience gather again and watch this play in which the gender roles are reversed and we have a powerful woman and a powerless boy. Uh, and so the play would have been performed in tandem and is thus creating a conversation across the two plays about these themes of power and love and sexuality. Lily's prose uh, is challenging for a modern reader. Lily's prose looks very patterned and indeed very poetic if we think about poetry as having these formal qualities that Lily's prose engages with. For his contemporary audience, Lily's prose looks radically simplified. Uh, he, he shortens the English sentence so that the early modern sentence was a prolex, complex thing, and it favoured additive writing, that is, phrases which end with the word and, or but, or so, thus generating never-ending sentences. Lily wrote short, precise clauses in short and precise sentences, and so that's the first thing that contemporaries see. What we notice when we look at Lily are these patterns, and the patterns are very exciting. So we're talking about patterns where you have repetition of sound in the form of alliteration or of rhyme, for example, or repetition of syntax where one phrase will be balanced against the, the other. And where Lily's prose is most challenging is in the way it wants you to rethink and worry about the words that are being pitted against one another. So, for example, Cupid in uh, a later play, Galatea, says that he will, um, he will uh, play at truancy in order to demonstrate his tyranny. And, it, and Lily wants you to think about the idea of truancy and tyranny, the way that they both alliterate and rhyme. The very first sentence Lily writes in his very first book uh, tells us that Helen of Troy was painted with her hair loose because she was loose. Now that might not be very hilarious anymore, but you can already see him wanting you to think about what it means to be loose. The problem with allegorical readings of Lily's work has been that it's just been very precise. So people are seeing equations whereby this character equals that character and that character equals this character. Where the, where the allegory operates in Lily's work is in its, its, re, its representation of courtiership in general. So that as Feo, for example, becomes an emblem for everybody in the room. Uh, and I suppose the analogous case would be Midsummer Night's Dream, where, for example, you could see that Titania and indeed the moon throughout that play uh, is, is being depicted in, in ways that make us think about Elizabeth I, oh, me thinks how slow this old moon wanes. But that doesn't mean that every time Titania is on stage and every time she speaks, she is Elizabeth I. And so I think that an automatic equation between this character and that is far too simple for what Lily's doing. Lily's asking questions rather than trying to draw precise diagrams about real people. After the 1580s, it's really hard to pin down Lily himself as a writer. We get occasional manuscript glimpses that he is still writing, and it's very unclear what's happened to him. Despite his reputation for being a conservative royalist, Lily actually holds the dubious distinction of having his theatre company liquidated twice by the authorities, 1584 and 1590, giving a strong evidence that he's actually a very worrying figure for the authorities. And so he may simply have been censored out of existence as a writer. He becomes a member of parliament through the 1590s. Let's not hold that against him. And uh, he's certainly writing some form of play in about 1600. We have a manuscript speech that survives of that play. The other glimpse we have of Lily are two letters that he writes to Elizabeth I asking for a particular job at court. And these have been used by all scholars since to demonstrate that he has um, fallen into such poverty that he's reduced to begging. These letters are actually extremely interesting because there's no evidence at all they were sent to Elizabeth. What happened to them were well, they were copied out and sent around the country as models of prose style should you wish to persuade somebody to do something. And they become the most copied letters in the country in the early modern period. So yet more evidence of how people are just hoovering up any scrap of Lily's authorship they can get their hands on. If we take the sequel to Sappho and Feo, which is a play called Galatea, Galatea could easily be put forward as the most influential play on the early modern stage. This is the play that introduces to the stage the idea of young girls who cross-dress. 
introduces to the stage the idea of people who run away into a wood and fall in love by mistake. Uh, and it also introduces the idea that the people who've been wooing through the play ought to go off to church at the end. Where Lily looks very different to us is the two people falling in love are both women. And Shakespeare spends his entire career recovering from that idea. Every one of his cross-dressing plays uh, straightens out that notion in some way or other. And Shakespeare is quoting or using Galatea in every one of his comedies, from Two Gentlemen of Verona all the way up to The Tempest. So The Tempest second scene, for example, in which Prospero explains at great length to Miranda who she is and keeps interrupting himself and saying, you're not listening, you're not listening. That comes straight out of the first scene of Galatea. Lily's influence is also felt at a much more material level in that he invents the idea of printing your plays for people to read. And here we have this notion of the DVD of the rock concert that you missed. People, again, were hoovering up this material. He's the first playwright to do this, but he also becomes the first and one of the very few playwrights whose plays seem to sell out and require reprints. And this is where the market for printed plays comes from. People simply weren't publishing their plays before Lily does this. And immediately after Lily's printing spree, which ends in 1592, we suddenly get this enormous market opening up from 1594 onwards for printed plays. If Shakespeare's plays hadn't been printed, we would have lost all of his work. We have a speech from Titus Andronicus. We have a very strange version of Henry IV. And that is it of Shakespeare's work. It all depends on this market, which Lily creates. For 400 years, the estimation is that Lilly is a terrible writer. He is the most celebrated writer in his own period. For about 60 years, he's the best-selling writer, and contemporaries are continually um, commenting to one another how astonishing he is. You get these strange lists of contemporary writers being drawn up with Lilly at the top, and Shakespeare somewhere in the middle. And even in Shakespeare's first folio, when Ben Jonson writes that famous poem to Shakespeare's brilliance and says, thou didst our Lily outshine, that, that line tells us that Lily's become the litmus test of literary excellence. If you're better than Lily, you're definitely fantastic. After the Civil War, Lily just drops off the cultural radar entirely, and he shares that fate with people like Marlowe, and to a certain extent with Shakespeare. And it's not until the 18th century that we get um, uh, Shakespeare being canonized as the great writer. And it's in the very decade that that happens, the 1740s, this is the decade in which we get statues to Shakespeare in Stratford, for example. In, in the 1740s, we suddenly get these extraordinary attacks on Lily. And where Shakespeare's being defined as the great English patriarch, the masculine, naturally gifted writer, Lily's being defined as French, far too female. Their names take on an allegorical significance at this point. Shakespeare seems satisfyingly phallic and Lily seems a bit girly. People are talking about this through the 18th and 19th century. And Lily's dismissed in these terms. In the last four or five years, actors have been dismissing all of this and playing with Lily in staged readings and indeed in some full productions and keep reporting again and again how exciting Lily is on the tongue, that something that looks so complex and dense on the page takes life when you start to stage it and that Lily's characters think across the line as they're speaking in a way that just isn't true of other people from the period, including Shakespeare. The Globe's Red Not Dead series has staged all of Lily's plays now, and he, he remains the only writer who's made uh, audiences laugh and cry at the same production.